We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we're going to look today at a, at a great prophetic event. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, there's the invasion of what is called Gog and Magog. And most preachers, most prophecy preachers, in fact, most commentaries that you read about this passage will tell you that this is a, is a divine prophecy about, the, about Russia invading Palestine and Russia invading the nation Israel. And I want to tell you to start with, you're going to discover as we study together today that this, has, this passage has nothing to do with Russia. It has to do with a future invasion of Palestine and a future invasion of the nation Israel. Israel, but Russia is not a part of it. There are two great fallacies that, that, that come upon people when they study Ezekiel 38 about the invasion of Gog and Magog, and one is that Gog is Russia. And I'm going to show you without any question that Gog isn't Russia. The Antichrist has nothing to do with Europe, with the United uh, the European Union, I'm sorry for all the prophecy preachers and all the sensational peddlers and all the fear peddlers and all the rest of them, all the people that, that claim to be able to tell you what Bible prophecy is going to be by reading the newspapers, they forgot to read their Bible. And when you don't read the Bible and you try to interpret prophecy by not reading the Bible but by reading the newspapers, you're going to be wrong. They make two great mistakes when they, when they, when they come to Ezekiel 38 to make it Russia. Uh, one is the two great fallacies that prophecy preachers make is one, identifying Gog and Magog as Russia, and two, concluding that Russia will invade Israel before the coming of Christ. Now, Russia may invade Palestine. I don't know. But if and when they do, it will not be in fulfillment of any Bible prophecy. Now, that's a bold statement. You say, Rick, how, you know, who are you, Jordan, to say that I am nobody? I don't want you even to know my name. I just want you to believe what these verses say. Now look with me at Ezekiel 38. And, and by the way, there are actually two invasions of Gog and Magog. This one takes place before the Millennial Kingdom. And then there's one that takes place after the Millennial Kingdom. Maybe I should get the chalkboard out. You know the scenario of how we go through the chart. You have prophecy back here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes into the, earth, in, in, into the uh, earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He dies on the cross. He's buried. He's resurrected. He ascends into heaven. The Holy Spirit comes in the book of Acts. There comes a point where there's the fall of Israel, and salvation goes to the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory reaches down to save Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul the apostle, and reveals to him a system of information about the church, the body of Christ, a new agency. Back here, the issue... The, the agency is the nation Israel, and here is the body of Christ. This information is called a mystery, that is a secret. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. The books of Romans through Philemon in your Bible make this information manifest. Prophecy back here is that which is spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets since the world began. Everything that the, the, the prophets preached, talked about, and made known back here since the world began is called prophecy. Mystery is that which was kept secret since the world began. God planned it before the world began, kept it secret, didn't reveal it till you come to the Apostle Paul. Those two dis divisions in your Bible, that's the great division in the Word of God. And if you're going to understand a passage like Ezekiel 38, you're going to understand the prophetic program, you're going to need to understand that the, the, the mystery program where we are today in the dispensation of the grace of God where he's forming the body of Christ interrupted the prophetic program. It didn't do away with it. We didn't become Israel. God has interrupted Israel's program today. One day the dispensation of grace will end. Christ will come back and catch the body of Christ away to be eternal in the heavens with him at the event we call the rapture. Then what God had prophesied back here will continue on. And the books of Hebrews through Revelation deal with that. The first thing in order out here is what, what the Bible calls the, the tribulation, the time of, uh, of the wrath of, of God against those that rebel against him. Christ comes back over here, sets up his uh, kingdom, binds Satan in the bottom of his pit for a thousand years, and you have his king, the, the, what we call the millennial kingdom. The, the first stage, the transition into the eternal kingdom is that 1,000 year period of time uh, that we call the, the millennium. Oh, for that word thousand. At the end of a thousand years, Satan is let out of the bottomless pit, and uh, he, he gathers the nations again together against God, and then there's the great white throne judgment, and then there, there's the new heavens and the new earth. Satan's cast in the bottomless pit, all the defend are cast out of the kingdom, and then you go into the dispensation of the fullness of time. Now, in Revelation chapter 20, you read about Gog and Magog, 
being used by Satan here at the end of the millennium. But in Ezekiel chapter 38, you're reading about the battle of Gog and Magog, the invasion, here at the beginning of the millennium. They're separated by a thousand years. The reason it's that way is that what starts here isn't over with till here. There is a judgment that begins back here that doesn't finally come to its, end, its, its final conclusion till you come to the great white throne judgment. And what you learn about the millennial kingdom is the transition into the eternal state where he rules and reigns in the midst of his enemies. Satan is cast out. No one will ever be able to say, stand before God and say, Satan made me do it. Adam and Eve could say that. They could go back here and blame it on, blame it on the devil. In fact, Adam did that. Eve did that. The serpent. <laughs> you know, Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. And she said, the serpent said, God says, no, no, I'll show you. Perfect environment. Everything's right. Social justice, perfect ecology. Everybody's green. Everybody's everything is good. Perfect health. You have universal health care. You have all the things everybody wants to have. Perfect peace and prosperity, the dis dissemination of wealth uh, on an on a, on a, uh, even basis all over. You have, a, you have purified government. Think about that one for you. Think about the mayor of your town being a saint of the Most High God. Whoo! <laughs> the legislatures in your town, the state government in your town, being interested in doing nothing but the will of God. There's nothing like that on the earth today. Not anywhere you've ever lived anyway. That's going to be a great day. But he's going to still have his enemies. And at the end, Satan is left let out of the bottomless pit, and he gathers a great host. So there's really the invasions of Gog and Magog. Now, you know they're different, because in, in, in Ezekiel 38, the battle is followed by the kingdom, by the reign of God in the earth. In Revelation, it's preceded by the kingdom, by the reign of God in the earth. So you know they're different, okay? They're not the same. They're, 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 there's an obvious difference between them. But um, the, over here, they, they fall on the mountains of Israel. Over here, they just, they, they're just destroyed by, by the, uh, the great white throne descending from heaven. So they're, they're, there's a lot of differences in them. Over here, it's all the nations of the earth. Over here, it's just a select few of them, and that's the point we're getting to. This invasion in Ezekiel 36, at the beginning of the, at the end of the tribulation, the purpose of it is to wipe, take all of the enemies out of the land, and leave only the nation Israel in the land. Now, the common mistake that people make about Ezekiel 38 is saying that it is Russia who's going to be there, and it's not Russia. Now, the way they get that is verse number two, Ezekiel 38, verse two. I know I'm talking fast, by the way. I understand that. Okay? You don't have to write me and tell me don't talk so fast, Brother Rick. I know I'm talking fast. There's a lot of information to go over. The average person talks at 110 words a minute. The average person listens at 300 words a minute. I try to split the difference for you. You can listen faster than most people talk, so there's no sense in me going, Now, dearly beloved, would you please... Yeah, you'll be bored stiff and looking at cartoons before this thing's over with. It's okay. You can think. You don't, I don't need filler. i got more to say than I'll ever get in 30 minutes. If I talk three times as fast as I'm going, I'd never get through. Okay? And I like to get an hour's worth in in 30 minutes. That way we double our money. <laughs> uh, well, you, you understand. But don't get, don't get caught up in what's going on. Write the verses down. It's a critically important you look at the verses, though. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Because it's important you look at the verses, because I'm telling you, this passage is teaching something far different than what you hear preachers say it teaches. And you need to be able to look at the verses and understand why I said that. And if you don't want to believe what I'm saying, that's your business. But I'm not saying, I'm just going to tell you what the verses say. So if you don't believe what the verses say, then that's between you and the Lord. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man... Set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog, the chief, priest of, uh, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against, them, against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, if you've got a reference Bible, if you've got any Bible beside a King James Bible, it didn't really say that, did it? It said, Gog, uh, uh, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. In other words, the first thing they do is to take King James Bible and change it. And any time somebody comes along to prove their doctrine, they have to change the King James Bible. The thing you do with them is you, you, you take them like a, just like, a, like a piece of chalk and just toss them. Just like that. That's what the, you know, wash your hands and go back to your Bible. 
Because they got something they're trying to prove. And if you have to change the King James Bible to prove your doctrine, you just demonstrated what you're doing. You don't believe the Bible's Word of God. You don't believe God wrote it, preserved it for you, put it in your hands today. You believe that you have the right to decide what the Bible says. Now, when people, people make money changing it. There's more speculation, there's more ability to hype people up, there's more sensationalism to say it's Russia, and let's change the text to make it that way. I'm going to show you in a minute, verse with verse, it can't be Russia, it isn't Russia. And when you change your Bible text, you made a mistake. But you would have been safe if you hadn't changed your Bible text to start with, and you just took what the King James Bible said and stood on it. Now, you say, well, Brother Jordan, that's just your opinion. No, that's a fact. You might not like it, but it's still the truth. It's still a fact. You'll see it if you stick around for the next few minutes and look at the verses on it. I got a reference Bible here. It says the, that the primary references to the northern European powers headed up by Russia all agree. Well, no, they don't all agree. You know who doesn't agree? God doesn't agree. Guess who's going to be right? Somebody gets on TV, you know, got, him, got, got a big TV program, goes, all, goes far more than our program, I understand that. Gets on there and he says, well, it's Russia. And his wife says, okay, sugar, it's time for you to talk now. And he says, it's Russia. Well, I don't care if your wife gives you permission to talk every now and then. You say, it's Russia. It ain't Russia. Who is Gog in the text? We'll look down at verse number 16. Who is Gog that's in the land of Magog? Gog is the prince and Magog is his land. Who is this that's invading Palestine here? Verse 16, thou, thou shalt come up against my people, O Israel, as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the, in the last, latter days that I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me. When is he going to bring them against his land? In the latter days. Now, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, you know that the latter days is a reference to this time period over here. That's a prophetic term, term that's coined by the prophets in, in Scripture back here, looking toward this time period over here, when God is going to rid the land of Palestine from the enemies of Israel. And here's the day it's coming. When I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before thy, their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he, talking about Gog, of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? Who is it? Back here, that the prophets, all through the prophetic scripture, have prophesied that God was going to bring against Israel out here. Well, it's the Antichrist. No, it's, we're talking about the Messiah. Well, who is the other character? It's the Antichrist. In the text, Gog is the Antichrist. He's the one that God has prophesied. Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my serpents, 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 servants, the prophets? Who is he? The book of Job, the first book ever written, has passage after passage after passage. There, uh, by the way, there's more personal description of the actual physical appearance of the Antichrist in the book of Job than anywhere else in the Bible. God's been telling Israel about this guy from day one, first book of the Bible ever written. The prophets have told Israel that God's going to bring a deceiver against them. He's going to bring one who's going to, going to be the, the rod of mine indignation against them. A false messiah. The Antichrist. Well, who is Gog? Gog is the Antichrist in the, te in the text. Now, that tells me something. Come with me to the book of Daniel, chapter number 8. That's where everybody gets the idea that the Antichrist is, is going to be... Well, I shouldn't say where everybody gets the idea that the Antichrist is going to be Russia... But when you, when you realize that Gog is the Antichrist, you know immediately we're not talking about Russia. By the way, you're also not talking about any of the European powers. Daniel chapter number 8, there's a fascinating passage here about these last days. Look with me, if you will, to verse, Daniel chapter 8. The third year of the, of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel after that, that, that had appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I was in a vision, and I was by the river Eula. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there, 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 there stood before the river a ram, 
which had two horns. And the two horns were high, and one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. So the first thing he sees is a ram. Now this is important, you've got to follow this. He sees a ram. It's got two horns, okay? And have two horns to it. And I saw a ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. And he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a, a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and the ram unto, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he, had, he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver him out of his hand. Therefore the, the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So, so the ram comes up, and then comes up after him the he-goat. And the he-goat's got one big horn out, out of him. Now, the, the he-goat destroys the ram, takes over what the ram has, and he, ru he, ru he rules. He blows the ram off, the, off, he replaces the ram. Now, what are we talking about? Well, he's going to interpret it. Go down with me to verse number 17. Understand, O son of man, that for at the, at the time of the end it shall be the vision. This vision is going to talk to you about something going to happen over here in the time of the end. Okay? Verse number 19. He said, Behold, I will make thee know what, what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For the time appointed of the end shall, shall it be. This is going to refer to this, this period of time right over here. So this vision back here is going to have something to do with this. Verse number 20. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. The, kings, the, king, the ram is the kingdom of Media and Persia. How do I know? That's what the verse said. What's going to follow Babylon? Media, Persia. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. So the goat's going to be Greece. What kingdom's going to follow? Media Persia. Greece. And the, the great horn which is between his eyes is, is the first king. Who's the first king of Greece? Right, Alexander the Great. The first king of Greece. Now, it's important to follow this. Go back down with me to verse number 9. Verse number 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when it was strong, a great horn was, the great horn was broken. So Alexander is going to be broken, and out of Alexander, four notable ones. There are going to be four kingdoms come up out of Greece. One, two, three, four are going to come out of Greece. Now watch carefully. And out of one of them, out of one of these four divisions of the Greek Empire, not one of the divisions of the Roman Empire. I'm sorry, Jack, it ain't working for you. Out of one of these came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven. Verse 11, Yea, he shall magnify himself even to the prince of the host. Who is that? Well, it's the Antichrist. Come down with me to verse number 22. Now that being broken, wherefore four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the, na out of, out of the nation, not, a, not in his power. So out of Greece is going to come four kingdoms. And it did, if you study history. You can go back and study history, and you can find the, 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 the four divisions, Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt, that come out, that come out of, 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 of the Greek Empire. Those four kingdoms are going to come, verse 23, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sayings shall stand up. In other words, the Antichrist is going to come out of one of the divisions of this kingdom right here. 
This bird here that comes over here, Gog, the Antichrist, that dude is going to come out of one of those four divisions of the Greek Empire. Now if you go back to Daniel chapter 2, we had the head of gold, where you start out with Babylon, then you have the, 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 the breast and arms up here of Media Persia, the two arms of the two divisions here, then you have the, the belly and thighs of Greece, and then you have the two legs, but when you have a belly and when you have thighs, you already got two legs coming, don't you? Then you have that two-legged kingdom down here. Two of these kingdoms here, one of them will be the king of the north, and one will be the king of the south. That's Daniel chapter number 11. We don't have time to read it. Read it yourself. You can do that. He starts out in Daniel 11 with Media Persia, replaced by Greece, replaced by these two kingdoms. And one of those two kings, the king of the north, becomes this guy. But the king of the north isn't Russia. It's the king of the north that came out of Greece. Russia didn't have anything to do with that. You know who he is? Come over with me to Micah, uh, well, make it Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Every one of these guys, if you go back to Ezekiel, every one of them are in Palestine, or in the Middle East, I should say, in countries around Palestine. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him, God says. O Assyrian, talking right here, O Assyrian, he's going to be the rod of mine indignation. Daniel 8 said he's going to be for the time of that indignation out there. I will send him against the hypocritical nation, God says, against the people of my wrath shall I give him a charge to take the, the spoil and to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth, the, doth his heart uh, think so, but it is in, her, in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. That's what that verse in Psalms, mean when it say, Psalms means when it says that God's going to make the wrath of men praise him. He's not talking about somebody cutting you off in, 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 in the freeway and you get a little road rage and that God using that wrath to praise him. He's not talking about that kind of foolishness. I'm a preacher. I hear preachers talk that kind of dumb talk. It's not what he's talking about. When he says he's going to use the wrath of men to praise him, he's talking about that right there in prophecy. The Antichrist is going to seek to destroy Israel. He don't mean to help Israel. He's not going to mean to do the will of God, but God's going to use his wrath against Israel for his glory. Now watch it back in Ezekiel. Watch God tell, tell this guy that's exactly what he's going to do. Ezekiel 38, verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited, and the land, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out, out of many people. Verse 10. Uh, thus saith the Lord. In other words, Israel is going to be gathered back into the land when this guy does this. Verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time uh, she, shall things come into, my, into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the, to the land of unwalled villages, in, in, and I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates. Ezekiel never saw a city like that. They all had bars and gates and cities around it. Walls are irrelevant today over here. You see, what he, that's why he says, God, I'm going to put a hook in you and I'm going to bring you. God's going to bring the, the Antichrist against Israel, bring them up there in that land, into that valley of decision, and then he's going to destroy them, pour his wrath out on them, and remove the enemy out of the land, and do it so thoroughly that Ezekiel 38 says it'll take seven months. They'll be over here into the millennium before they get them all buried. And they're going to set up a big monument. We bury our dead. Arlington Cemetery. I've been to the Philippines and Manila and seen that great cemetery there with, with the 70 some odd thousand Americans that, were, that died in the Pacific in World War II. And you have this great memorial. They're going to have a memorial there to demonstrate the foolhardiness of rebelling against King Jesus. And they're going to be a memorial. Every time the, the nations come up to worship God in Jerusalem, they're going to have to, when they leave, they're going to walk out there by that memorial and see how foolhardy it is. Actually, going to be three monuments like that. My point to you is, Ezekiel 38, God's going to restore the land of Israel back into their kingdom. And when he does, he's going to take out all the enemies out of the land. That hadn't got anything to do with Russia. It hadn't got anything to do with the United States of America. It hadn't got anything to do with anything you're going to be a part of today. It has to do with God completing his purpose to reclaim this planet for Jesus Christ through the instrumentality of a kingdom that he's vested in the nation Israel. And if you don't rightly divide your scripture and you don't study your Bible dispensationally, you're not going to have a clue about what's going on in passages like that. But when you do, 
then you can save yourself from the fear mongers and the prophecy speculators that are trying to get you to read the newspaper today and make you think that reading the newspaper, you're reading the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. God today has interrupted prophecy and the prophet, prophetic program isn't what's happening today. God has interrupted prophecy and he's doing something different today. What God's doing today is not trying to reclaim real estate. He's not in the real estate business. He's not in the national reformation business. He's not in the business of reforming the economy. He's got a plan to do all that in the kingdom. What he's doing today is forming the church, the body of Christ. Taking Jews and Gentiles, bond and free, male and female, no matter who you are, what nation, what religion, what nationality, what, 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 what uh, gender you are, and taking people that trust his son exclusively putting us into that one spiritual body called the body of Christ, blessing us equally with us an absolute equality in Christ, and then using us to share that wonderful message of His grace with others as it transforms our life for His glory. That's what God's doing today. Now what are you doing? Are you doing what God's doing? If not, you can start today simply by trusting His Word to you. We'll be back next time. Until then, Maranatha.